So my name is Matthew Genusitis. I'm the president of a group called Octane. And, and Octane is a nonprofit organization for those of you guys that don't know it here in Southern California. And what we really try to do is connect people and ideas with capital and resources. And the goal is to ultimately get new businesses started and then ultimately to create jobs. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard, but there's a little bit of a budget crisis in the state of California. <laughs> and, and the trickle down effect of that is you know, the, the funding at the university levels have been reduced dramatically, right? And, and in so doing, it's created a tremendous opportunity. You know, there's a lot of these inverse relationships that go on. And the opportunity that's been created within the university is that as budgets have been cut, the university has become very open to licensing technology and has a strong desire to create entrepreneurial startups that are based on inherent university technology. And so we've gotten involved at Octane a lot with the university, with the Office of Technology Alliances, also with Tech Portal. And, and one of the great things that's going on at, at Tech Portal is, you know, this was really one of the first incubators that was created to, to take university technologies and kind of run with them. Uh, Jeff here also is affiliated with the Irvine Incubation Center, um, just in the university research park. And so this is a second incubator. And now Ralph Kleiman in the medical school is talking about creating a third incubator. So all of these things going on are really paving the pathway. So we can thank Arnold Schwarzenegger for the budget crisis. But the, the trickle down effect has been that, you know, it's really started to foster this growth of innovation. Um, Mega Patel mm -hmm. is from the Office of Technology Alliances. And one of the things that's gone on at OTA is a lot has been in, uh, put in place in order to facilitate technology licensing and help things get going. And Stephen Natowski, right, uh, is from the law firm of Kenobi, Martins, Olson, and Bear. And, uh, and Kenobi and Octane and Kenobi and the University of California and Irvine have worked very closely together over the years to try to help this entrepreneurial thing get going. And intellectual property is obviously one of the first steps. So with that, let me introduce uh, Mega, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll take it from there. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. All right, so um, as Matt mentioned, the, um, the Office of Technology Alliances here at UCI works to manage intellectual property to foster faculty and industry alliances and to commercialize technology for the public benefit. Okay, so this is just an overview of the tech transfer process at UCI. So research in university laboratories results in inventions, which are disclosed in a record of invention, which is submitted to our office. Um, it then undergoes a patentability and a marketability assessment. And then dependent on that assessment, a patent application may be filed. Um, the technology is then licensed, ideally, <laughs> to a company. Um, the patent costs are reimbursed to the university. Um, these types of uh, transactions can also um, uh, result in uh, side agreements that um, go through sponsored projects in the Office of Research that can further support additional research in university laboratories. Um, the license agreement with the company that's licensed the technology has diligence requirements for the development of the technology that results in ultimately a public benefit through the um, introduction of new products and services. Um, for the, from the university perspective, uh, net fees and royalties are generated from these agreements. And those, um, those fees and royalties are shared um, with the inventors receiving 35%, the inventor departments receiving 15%, and the campus um, itself receiving 50%. So the start of this process is, um, uh, is triggered by the record of invention form. It's available at our website, and there are also some hard copies up at the front if anyone would like to get one on their way out. Um, typically, the lead inventor will complete the form, submit the form to our office. Uh, and it's then assigned to the appropriate licensing officer for review and evaluation. So I thought I'd walk you through some of the important parts of the ROI. Um, obviously the title, the general subject matter, the names of people that are connected with the work. Um, and do note that in the event that a patent application is filed, um, actual inventorship will be determined by a patent attorney. That's a, that's a matter of patent law. And um, then a brief description of the invention. What is it? How is it done? What's the purpose? Uh, funding sources are also important from our perspective as a sponsor may already have the first right to negotiate a license to the technology. Um, so to list the funding sources for the project under which the invention was made and any kind of identifying information as to grant numbers, PIs, that sort of thing. Relevant dates are also very important. Um, they can establish who was first to invent, uh, reduction to practice, and also whether any patent bar dates have been established. 
So um, we asked for when the uh, invention was first conceived and the first written description and when the first successful operation was and uh, to who and when it was disclosed. Um, as I said, public enabling disclosures are important because they may have set up a patent bar date. So if you've disclosed this invention to non-UCI personnel, either orally in writing or through a demonstration or a poster, um, that information is very useful for us. Um, if the subject matter has been published or is um, in the process of being published, if there's a manuscript that's, that's, in, that's in the works, um, and if you have a planned submission date or an, or a, or an actual um, publication date, those are also very useful for us to know. Um, and also, if you know of any prior art um, or work that may, uh, that may bear on the invention in terms of um, you know, sort of related ideas and what other people have been working on in that general area, that's useful for us as we do our patentability analysis. Um, to further assist with the commercialization of the invention, um, sort of what are the advantages um, of the invention? How was the problem solved in the past? And what were the disadvantages that still had to be overcome? Uh, what, what are the advantages of your invention um, over the prior, uh, prior ways of doing the same, the same sort of, um, the same sort of thing? And uh, if you have detailed examples or drawings, and you can also include, if you have a manuscript in progress, you can include a copy of that manuscript with the ROI. Um, again, for commercialization purposes, um, it's useful for us to know, again, what are the proposed uses, if you can give a detailed description of how to make and use it. Um, has this invention had any public or commercial use? And if so, uh, when and where? And if it's, um, if it's um, <coughs> public use that may be uh, imminent, if you can let us know when that date may be. And also, this is particularly important for um, commercialization purposes, is um, any companies that you think may be interested in, in hearing about your invention. And w what we can do is we can contact them. If they're interested, we can provide them with a non-confidential disclosure. If they're, if they're interested in discussing it further, they can sign a confidentiality agreement, and then we can provide them with more detailed information to see if they'd be interested in taking a license to that technology. Um, and then the last page is essentially just signatures and um, written signatures. And then if there are any non-UC collaborators, that's useful for us to know as well. So as I said, the completed ROI is submitted to our office and assigned to the appropriate licensing officer. It's then evaluated for patentability, including reduction to practice, the commercial potential of the invention, and any disclosures that may have set uh, patent bar dates. Uh, the U.S. does allow a one-year grace period from the first public enabling disclosure, but for international rights, they require absolute novelty. So it's, uh, it's actually better to have that information looked at for patentability purposes before there's a publication or, an, or a presentation of the scientific conference, if, if you are interested in maintaining and um, protecting IP rights. So as I said, contingent upon review, a patent application may be filed. This typically takes the form of a provisional patent application. This allows a, a one-year window within which to file the regular U.S. patent application, and you get the benefit of the provisional patent application filing date. That gives our office um, some time to assess the market potential, to identify some licensees, to see if there's some interest in taking a license. And if no licensee is found within this one-year period, then the application is typically abandoned. Um, and I will note that international patent rights are very, very expensive, and the university will not proceed with international filings unless there is a licensee to the technology. Uh, so if there are no UC use resources utilized and the invention is outside the scope of employment, then the inventor can request a waiver and can proceed with, if they wanted to develop that technology independently of the university, they can proceed down that route. Um, if the invention is within the scope of employment and a patent application is not filed, then under certain conditions the invention may be released to the inventor. But this uh, typically requires that no further use of UC resources um, be devoted to further developing the invention. So the benefits of submitting a complete ROI are that they provide an official record of the invention. They serve as the basis for a patentability review by our staff and patent attorneys. And they can also serve as the basis for a non-confidential disclosure that our office can draft uh, that can be sent to potential licensees that may be interested in licensing the technology. So a few suggestions. Um, uh, if you are interested in protecting IP rights or, um, that, are, that are related to your invention, um, you can contact our office before publishing um, so that we can assess the patentability and the commercial, commercial potential of that invention um, and help to put together some IP protection before, uh, it's a, it, before it's made publicly available. Um, if you uh, have any ideas about who might be interested in licensing that technology from us, we're certainly interested in hearing about that because we 
have been working closely in that field, you probably know of uh, companies or uh, you know individuals that might be interested in, in working with you to commercialize that technology. And as I said, we can also draft non-confidential disclosures for marketing purposes and then confidentiality agreements as um, negotiations with potential licensees proceed. Um, so I think I'll turn it over to Stephen now to talk about sort of the basics of patent law, which I think might be useful, and then we can uh, take questions at the end. Can I turn lights on? There we go. Thank you. I'm Steve Natopsky, and I'm the managing partner of Kenobi Martins. Kenobi Martins is a patent, trademark, and copyright law firm uh, right here in Orange County. And we've always had a very special relationship with the UCI and with Octane and other Orange County organizations because we grew up here with those institutions. Uh, our firm was started in 1962 right here in downtown Santa Ana, right about the time that the school was started. And throughout the course of the school expanding and us expanding, we've had just a very close relationship and really value and appreciate all of the good work that the UC system and organizations like Octane have done to develop technology and, and made Orange County really one of the amazing hotspots up with the valley up in Northern California and the Research Tech Triangle in North Carolina, we are one of the amazing places for development and research and, and innovation in the world. And we've seen that of late. We're at a time now, historically, that's just absolutely incredible. It really makes things like the Industrial Revolution, if you're history buffs, look like a high school science fair. Uh, I mean, if you look at just from, uh, I'm, I'm sure that I'm older than you, but if you remember from when we came out of school, uh, you know, there were a computer would be something that you might be able to fit in this room, but maybe not. And we had no voicemail, and we had no email, and we had no cell phones, and we had mimeographs. Who remembers a mimeograph machine? <laughs> two people. Uh, <laughs> you look way too young for that. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but you can go on Google now, and you can look and see. Well, what the hell was that mimeograph machine that he was talking about? It was something we used in school growing up. But. We're at a time now where things are moving so rapidly and so incredibly fast on so many different technology levels from creating gene research and creating new, um, actually people in test tubes, which just won the Nobel Prize, to electronics and software and you know, the amazing, I just came up from seeing your inventions downstairs, which even five or ten years ago you wouldn't have dreamed about. And uh, people are getting patents on these things and so uh, Magda and the, uh, the whole team that she has there are incredibly valuable and oftentimes what people do now is inventors looking at things think everything is obvious and we can talk about you know what you need to get to get a patent but inventors tend to be people who are incredibly smart and think that everything that they see is obvious and one of the standards that you have to satisfy to get a patent in the US is that you have to show your invention is not obvious but it's not obvious to someone of ordinary skill in your field. And the people that are in this room and people that are working, you're way, I don't even have to, I know because you're in this room, you are way smarter than the ordinary person in your field. You're already associated with the university. That takes you to a whole nother level that most ordinary people don't have. And so even though you may think that things may be obvious, the most important thing for you to do is to fill out those ROI forms and give them to her and have her be able to look at them because she has the experience and the education and background to know what things may have incredible potential even though the inventor might be sitting there you might be sitting there and saying oh that was easy i came up with that overnight most inventions are you saw the old cartoons where the light bulb would go on over the person's head that's what most inventions are they don't take months or years to develop they pop into your mind oftentimes very quickly to solve a problem. And you're writing a code or you're working on something and all of a sudden you think, oh, a way around that is X. Turn that X into an ROI for her to look at because it oftentimes may be patentable. Even though as the inventor, you say, oh, that was just so simple, that was obvious. But that oftentimes is not the case. The US Patent Office has issued about nine million patents, nine million. And clearly, if everything was obvious, they wouldn't be anywhere near 9 million. And the rate at which patents are issuing has been skyrocketing. 
over the last five or 10 years and continues on really a geometric curve upward. So taking a step back, who am I? Uh, again, I'm the managing partner of Kenobi Martins. Uh, in a former job, I was an engineer. I received my engineering degree from a small university outside of Boston, Tufts University. Uh, then went to New York University and got my law degree. For the last 20 years, I've been working at Kenobi Martins right down the street. And, uh, and in that time, I do two things in my daily job, really three things, but two important things. Uh, the two important things are number one, half of my day is applying for the patents and trademarks and copyrights. And so we work with you and UCI and other institutions, Stanford, Harvard, UPenn, Caltech, uh, etc. And take all of the inventions that people like you come up with and fill out your ROIs on and turn those into patents and value for the university and for the inventors themselves, as well as companies. The other half of what I do is litigation. And in litigation, I'm taking that patent that's obtained, which is the document that evidences your rights in the invention, and trying to convince a jury that that patent is either infringed or not infringed, depending on which table I'm sitting at in the courtroom. <laughs> and about half of my cases, I'm the plaintiff and asserting my rights, and half the cases, I'm the defendant and saying that my person is innocent. And, uh, <laughs> And, and so that's something that takes half the day. Interestingly, in down economies such as this, the litigation side gets incredibly busy. Our business is somewhat counter-cyclical because when times are tight, as you mentioned, oftentimes universities like the UC system and the regents in Northern California, as well as the other universities and clients, they are looking for sources of money and they're looking for profits. And you know, they, oftentimes they you know, open that closet door and wait a minute, what's that big box of patents we've got? And they pull it out and they dust it off and they say, wait a second, there are people that are using some of this and we should be paid a royalty for that. And so companies and universities in a down economy oftentimes are taking the portfolio that they were, that they were building and they assert those patents as a, a source of revenue and, and millions and millions if not billions of dollars are generated in that fashion across the country all the time. So when times are good, typically there's a lot of research and development and the patent prosecution side of the business is very busy. People are applying for patents. There's more money to pay for attorneys to do that. Um, they get a bunch of patents and then when times get a little bit tighter, oftentimes they enforce those patents uh, with much more vigor than they otherwise would. And so we've seen that area be, been very busy in the last a uh, couple of years as it was after the dot-com bubble in 2001, as it was after the recession in 94, et cetera. So, uh, so I lucked out. I'm in a good place. I'm in a good career. I just mentioned I love going to work every Monday. It's a wonderful, fantastic thing. I don't have too many friends after 20 years that can say that. And so it's a lot of fun. And it's fun working with creative, incredible people like yourselves, but oftentimes you don't get to work with me unless you go to her first. And so that's why these ROIs are incredibly important because the things that you think of are incredibly great ideas oftentimes and can be patented and let them make the call and the decision whether it makes sense to do so or not. And be sure to get them involved at a very early stage because that's important. So any, I was hoping that there would be some questions. I'd be happy to go in any direction. I could go back to basics of patents. What is a patent? What does it look like? What do I have to show the patent examiner sitting in Washington, D.C. to get them to allow the patent? I can do all that. I could do that in three minutes. I could do that in 13 hours in a UCI course. Uh, <laughs> so any questions at all or anything, I can, anything you've been curious about or hoping to get out of today that I could help answer? Yes. Like many areas, the, whether a patent is granted broad rights or narrow rights depends on time and depends on the types of judges that are in office at the time and serving. And so 
for you can look at any area of the law and it's always that way. It's a big pendulum. And so for a while you would have a, a court that would be very pro-patent and very pro-inventor. And then maybe to, over the course of 20 years the pendulum swings and they say, oh no, patents are out of control, they're too broad and they need to be narrowed. And then it swings back and goes back and forth. And through the course of, of any 40 or 50 year period you're going to be probably at each end of that spectrum or pendulum twice. Uh, right now we're somewhere in the middle and we're in the middle because the courts are having a very hard time keeping up with the unbelievable advancement in technology. And so you have laws that were put in place when technology was the phone that you pick up and have a rotary dial. And now all of a sudden in the real world we've gone through rotary dial to touch tone to uh, wireless phones that were like you know huge and big to ones that don't even need to have an antenna anymore to iPhones to droids and that's all happened so fast that the courts and Congress can't react fast enough and the patent office has a hard time keeping up as well and so I think one of the trends is that on the computer side um, right now the trend in my mind is going away from being pro patentee and I think courts are saying you know what it's been so pro patentee for so long they need to put the brakes on a little bit in that area and so you see things like I can't say anything bad about Amazon because we represent them but <laughs> you I'm sure you read in the papers that other people may believe not me other people may believe that you know when they issue patents for the one click that that might be hey that's just not fair because it inhibits uh, the freedom of the internet to expand now if we were 50 years ago where advances were just small increments over time I don't think you'd see that pushback but because there are so many brilliant people doing so many brilliant things that want to run forward you're seeing the courts be a little bit less uh, deferential to patent holders the other trend that you really see uh, in, in even my short 25 years of practicing is that juries are much more pro patentee now than they were before there used to be some skepticism and uh, you had to show that you had something really cool yeah you could have a patent but you had to show the jury that there was something amazing on top of that no longer really juries love patents when the patent issues it's a document and I'm sorry I didn't bring one but got a big blue ribbon on the front and it looks really nice and official and a juror typically won't appreciate and understand that oftentimes the examiner is a year out of college and may not have a full appreciation they just think because it's got a blue ribbon on it and it's issued that it's as good as gold and so we, what you'll oftentimes is see a jury which the patent issues can be very complex and a jury will just gloss over and they'll say, wait a second, that guy's got a patent, that's pretty cool. And so you see a lot bigger awards for patent infringement than you ever used to because juries, uh, juries will, will, will see the patent and if you can get in front of a jury as a patent holder, it, it's way better than it used to be. And keep in mind, you know, who shows up for jury service? Since we're on this sort of side tangent. <coughs> okay. Has anybody here been on a jury? Okay, a couple people. And so, were you the most educated person on the jury? By a lot? Yeah. Yeah. So, most of the jurors now are retired people or unemployed. Okay? And those are the people that show up. And they show up every time they get a notice. They don't try and get out of it. They, they're, they're there. And so, as a general rule, now, Orange County is a little, a little better because here in Orange County, the, the population as a whole is, is quite educated. But if you're in a more rural area, it's not as educated. And so juries as a whole typically don't even have a high school education. And so when oftentimes you try a case in front of one of these jurors, they'll do things that would, would blow your mind. And you may have been in a jury where you, know, you walk in and, and so what, one thing we do is we do jury research. So before we actually go to trial, because the stakes are so large, we hire people in the community similar to what the jury pool would be and we bring them in 
and then I present both sides of the case, so they don't say, oh, I like Steve better, or I didn't like Steve's hair, or I hate his tie, whatever. So I present both cases, and then we put them into rooms, and we let them deliberate, and we watch them with a camera. And jurors will, it, it's incredible, because the things that, as an educated person, you think would be important, oftentimes to a lay jury will not be. And so you'll get a sense where they're talking about, oh, I didn't like that guy's accent. And so you're like, okay, that's not the best witness because they just didn't like his accent, even though what he said was incredibly important and good. And so you'll pick up on these things, but the last jury that I had, and it was a good thing for me, because after you have a real case, you get to interview the jury, and oftentimes you interview them if you win, so not them what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but it was strange because I asked for $3 million, and the jury came back at $13 million. And so I, I wanted three million, and the other side said that they that we should get even if we won, we should get a hundred thousand. So everyone was sort of that's the bracket, right? It's, you know, three million for what I was asking for, and a hundred thousand if if they were asking for zero, but a hundred thousand even if they lost. And and so you know we went and said you know how'd you come up with that thirteen million? And they said, oh well we just thought we should divide the numbers. <laughs> and. But not only divide the numbers, but what happens when you divide three million by a hundred thousand? You get a small number, right? Yeah, you get you get thirty. So, how did they get from thirty to thirteen million? And they're like, oh, that's a good question. It's just a math mistake. They had no idea what they were doing. So, but but on the jury form, they say, you know, who should win? You know, plaintiff how much in damages, and you fill in a number, and once that number is there, that's it. They don't have to explain it. It's not like a test if you're you know, in UCI, and I, I, I've taught at UCI Paralegal Extension since 1992, and so you give them tests, and they answer all kinds of detailed questions, and you can tell from the questions and the answers whether they understand the concept or not. Juries don't do that. Juries just fill out a one-page form, the verdict form, and you can't tell at the end of the day whether they got it or not, or what was important to them or not. So. Getting back to your original question, those are two trends. Juries way more favorable to patents than they used to be. Uh, I think courts in the software area are becoming less pro-patent. They're still pro-patent to a, a sense, uh, but they're, they're concerned that they don't want to stifle innovation in the field given how many people are working hard to develop new search engines and new technologies. Um, in other areas, the mechanical arts and uh, biotechnology, um, space exploration, deep sea exploration, clean tech, nanotech, which are very hot right now. You see, you're still seeing both jurors and courts being very pro-patent. And because the, those industries are so young, especially on the nanotech and clean tech side, patents are very easy to get. Even very small incremental changes that overcome something that was a problem in the prior art, as she mentioned, are, are patentable. Yes, sir. So I, I've enjoyed the discussion. I work with a lot of small, small companies that are developing their patents. Um, they budget for that. But it's hard to determine if there's really value in patents when you say there's litigation. It's kind of what the figure is me there. Do you want to take people through like what a budget might be if you're a small, small company and you've got this ground, you know, middle ground type of patent and sure. what, what the value in your mind is, mm -hmm. if you don't mind? Okay. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, and again, it's going to depend dramatically on what, what the invention is. If it's something simple mechanical... It's middle ground, it's in the sweet spot. No sweet spot, okay. Um, again, it depends on how good the write-up is. So if there's an ROI write-up, then it's very inexpensive. To get a provisional on file is a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cost much at all. To do the full-blown patent application, depending on the technology, I would say sweet spot is 5 to 10K. And then... And then you pop file it, right? To file it. And you probably would need to budget that same amount again, another five to ten K for prosecution over the course of the next one to three years. The government says that they're trying to get patents issued three years after filing. They're not that quick. <laughs> uh, you know, if you call an examiner at five oh two and again, you know, they, they work hard and and we appreciate what they do, but they're on a clock. And oftentimes government employees can be like that. So um, they have quotas, though, which help counteract that, and they have to meet their quota. Uh, but unfortunately, their quotas lead. The, the patent system in the US Patent and Trademark Office is a little awkward and backwards, because they're on a quota, and they get points for rejecting things, but they don't get points for allowing. 
So they get their points by issuing a rejection. So you're almost always going to get a first rejection so that they can get their points. And then you negotiate with them and say, hey, I'll change this word. And, and I'm sure you're very involved in that process where you change this word and you change that word and then they give it to you. Because they want to get their points first. Where you think, you know, if you have a great invention, you just get it. But the government doesn't work that way. But we can go into who's at fault for that. I don't think that's Arnold. But, uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll figure out who that is. Um, so, so you're probably looking at, in that first three to four year period, 10 to 20,000. Eliminating the foreign rates, because she's right, if you decide I'm going to go to the foreign countries, um, oftentimes we'll file a PCT application, which is Patent Cooperation Treaty, to put the foreign rights on hold. That buys you an extra 20 to 30 months to decide, because we have our U.S. system. The U.S. system, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, we're clearly the ugly duckling of patent systems. Other countries do it very differently than we do. and. You have to then file in each of those individual countries. So if it's 10,000 here in the US and you're now interested in Japan and China and Brazil and Europe, now all of a sudden that's 10,000 in the US and 10 for each of those, so it's 40,000 for those. So you'll move that off several years. But taking the foreign out of the equation, uh, you're probably looking at you know anywhere from five to 20 over a four year period. And, and if I can ask a follow up on that, how much of the prior art research background are you going into as a firm? Is that more for the inventor to do and to make the patent office job easier? Do you, um, you know, the oftentimes the inventor knows about a lot of prior art, especially prior art in publications, and so they generally will bring a bunch of prior art to our attention and in fact have an affirmative obligation if they file a patent application. They must give all the prior art that's material and non-cumulative to the examiner for consideration, but we'll often do our own independent patent searching. Searching is usually anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500. and takes about two weeks to a month. And that's pretty well all-encompassing. Yeah. The yeah. But there's no obligation for an inventor to search. And so we have a lot of clients that say, you know what, the patent office is going to search later. Just let's file it. But that's where your background as a litigator really helps in that situation. You really don't know until it comes up, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you believe me, when you're asserting the patent later, the other side's going to really do searching. That's the first time you're going to get a ton of searching that will happen. And, and that's oftentimes the biggest defense in the patent action is that the patent's invalid because if the examiner had known about all the prior art, they wouldn't have issued the patent in the first place. But again, juries love patents, and every patent is entitled to a presumption under the law and has to be invalidated by clear and convincing evidence that's a really high standard. And so having the patent in hand as the first instance um, is important. The other thing is you know, how expensive is litigation? Incredibly expensive. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, many cases we take on contingency, where a plaintiff just doesn't have the money to enforce. And we'll say, you know, we'll take 30% of what we earn for you. If we don't earn anything, you don't pay anything. But if we earn something, then we, we get 30% and you get the other 70. That's very common. Um, most of the time, not most, but a lot of the time, companies are so large that, and they're asking for hundreds and hundreds of millions, they don't want to give us the 30%. They're like, you know, look, we gladly give you a million dollars because we're going to be able to settle it. Most cases settle um, because if, if I'm asking a defendant for a hundred million dollars, that's a huge risk for them to move forward because uh, it's going to cost them, you know, a million or two to defend and then they could get hit with a hundred million dollar verdict. With the yeah, so it, it's, you know, they'd much rather pay to license the patent, pay a few thousand dollars a month, and so oftentimes these types of um, litigation get settled for a license or a lump sum royalty payment. Okay, any other questions on that? On the other hand, I'm wondering, if, if someone in, in a remote village in Norway is sitting on a patent, Somewhere. You come up with it independently here, mm -hmm. five years later, it seems like that prohibits innovation. Is there any, are there any laws relating to, you have to try to commercialize it? Sort you of don't. Thing? You don't ever have to try and commercialize it. And there are very specific laws on what constitutes prior art and what doesn't. And so if an inventor in Norway comes up with something and is just hanging out with it and does something locally with it, that doesn't count as prior art in the U.S. Oh. And so you would be totally fine and you could have the invention here in the U.S. and exploit it here in the U.S. and be fine. However, if they got a patent in Norway and published it, then that published patent does become prior art worldwide. Uh, mm -hmm. And so 
it very well could, you could be in a situation where there's prior art in Zimbabwe and you just don't know about it. And maybe no one will ever know about it. But if it does come to light later on, you could have your patent in the US and you could say, oh, look, they were doing the same thing in Norway or Zimbabwe, and therefore that patent shouldn't have issued. So that happens, but not all that much. The US is really, you know, the US, Japan, and Europe are really on the cutting edge of many of these technologies. So it's quite rare that you see, you know, prior art in the computer software area coming from China. They're just not as advanced as we are today in the world. Yes? When filing a patent, does it make a difference whether you file it under your own company or individual self? Like, such as I can create an entity, mm -hmm. file under that, or file under my own name? Every, every patent has to be filed in the name of the true inventors. And so inventorship can't be something political. You can't say, oh, the company should be the applicant because that's who I work for. Or, you know, I want to name my supervisor on the patent because he was running the whole group. Um, you're not allowed to do that in the US. In, for, in every foreign country in the world, you can do that, not in the US. And so you have to list the actual inventors. Once you list the actual inventors, you can then assign the patent rights to anyone you want. So, they could be, for example, you might have a contractual obligation to assign to the UC Regents. If you're an employee. If you're an employee. And so that, then the UC Regents would be the owner, even though you'd always be the inventor. And uh, so ownership can be transferred around, it can be sold. Uh, another part of your question is the usefulness of getting the patent, even though litigating it might be expensive. Uh, and, and so I'm sure you see this with Octane all the time. But having a patent portfolio in place is incredibly attractive to VCs and angels. And so when you're going through those Series A financing, Series B financing, Series C financing, oftentimes the biggest asset that the investor is looking at is that patent or trademark portfolio. And so to get the capital necessary to grow the business it is often the reason why people get, develop strong patent portfolios in the first place. Keep in mind, again, um, the more data you have, the better off you're going to be in the long run. But I would suggest filling out these forms, these forms early and often. As I, I can't yeah. imagine that they're going to complain about getting three forms or four forms no. or five and, forms. And it's, a very, it's you know. a very interactive process, right? So anytime there's something new and exciting, we'd love to hear about it from the inventors. And we'll touch base with them periodically and say, you know, if we're, if we're waiting off on, on a set of experiments, you know, um, how, how's that going? Do you, you know, do you have anything you want to share with us? I mean, it's, 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 
it takes a lot of its lead from how entrepreneurial the, the faculty members are. Um, and if they're, you know, if they're really interested in, in carving out some really interesting IP, then it's a very interactive process and we work pretty closely to kind of, um, you know, to kind of maximize their IP protection. Um, of course, there is the priority issue, so you don't want to wait too long, you know, and so the sooner you get the ROI forms to us, you know, we can open a case file, we, get, we have a sense this is on the radar, we can kind of keep track of it, we can see what we're hearing from scientific publications, from conferences, from what other people are working on. So it just kind of gives us a sense of, of you know, where that work is relative to what else is going on in the field. And, and there are, you know, some very strict deadlines for filing of patents. Trademarks are different, you can do that at any time. But on the patent side, because of those strict deadlines, you want to get them in the loop super early so they can decide and make it a conscious decision, oh, okay, we're okay with waiving Canada or Mexico or other places, and then, but if you come too late in the process, you may have waived rights and then that may stifle the ability to get investors and the ability to come up with licensed partners. Because they may say, oh, you know, if you can't protect me in Mexico, I'm not gonna bother because someone's gonna you know, set up in Tijuana and compete directly with me and then I'm stuck. So getting them involved early, I think is really important. Yeah, I think it's uh, the faculty and researcher at the UCI, they are more interested in, in learning what the process in uh, allowing them to go forward with uh, the ROI. So after we have submitted ROI, what is the evaluation process taking place in OTA and what decision factor you use to decide this is the ROI, we will move forward to apply for a patent. Because uh, I always receive uh, some comments uh, from research and faculty. I have done my ROI and they were sitting on it for several years. So why they choose this one over the other one? So what is uh, the process? Can you well, so elaborate on that? When an ROI is submitted, it's processed um, up in Oakland and an official case number is assigned to it and then it's assigned to a licensing officer who evaluates the ROI. And um, the, the uh, lead contacts and the UC staff are, that are affiliated with that ROI will get a communication from the um, from o from Oakland saying that you know this is the official case number and the title and this is the licensing officer that will be managing your case. So if you have questions, you can contact them. The licensing officer then evaluates the ROI. We usually look for public upcoming public disclosure dates. Um, so that if there's something that's imminently going to be made public, we know to push that forward and look at it sooner rather than you know kind of just putting it in order that we receive it. Uh, and what we typically do is um, look at the the, the invention in, in terms of what else is out there, so that can involve doing a patent search and seeing what's already been published or issued uh, in the patent database, um, looking at publications in, in uh, PubMed or NCBI or in, in scientific journals, um, and just sort of seeing if there's something novel there, which is a, a uh, one of the yeah, issues that um, one of the um, the points that the patent office will look at is novelty, and then we look at it from an obviousness perspective. And that standard has actually gotten harder to overcome recently. They've uh, the patent office has made it easier to reject an application under obviousness than it was before. Um, so there are a number of factors, just from a patent law perspective, that we consider, and then we also look at it from a commercial perspective. Like, is there uh, is there um, a, a commercial partner that might be interested in working with us on that particular invention? And so it's, it's a multi kind of dimensional analysis. It's is there an organization in OTA, a sort of an oversight committee to review the ROI and make a recommendation to your office? So, because um, uh, usually I got uh, so many uh, comments from faculty working with us. They say, I really don't know what makes them decide not to move forward with my invention. Well, for example, so when, I, when, I find pa when I find prior art that essentially negates the novelty of this invention, I will send it to the, to, the, uh, to the primary lead inventor and say, I found this prior art which seems to disclose your invention. If you can distinguish your invention from the prior art, that's great, but you should know that this is out there and you may not have been aware of it before, but you know, that sort of impacts the novelty or the patentability of your invention. So you know, it, that, that opens up the opportunity for discussions and, and sort of interactions between our office and the inventors. Um, and you know, different licensing officers may have a different approach. Um, I would encourage the inventors to contact their licensing officer and say, can we have a meeting, can we have a chat, can we talk about what's going on? You know, maybe there's something that you're not 
miss that you're that you're not appreciating that in the ROI that I can explain to you better in person. So you know, we d we definitely are, are open to having you know discussions um, as frequently as, as investors <laughs> like. Um, and as I said, you know, sometimes there are there are points from the ROI that we may not appreciate, and it would take that kind of a discussion for us to say, oh yeah, maybe there is some potential here that we missed the first time around, or you know, if there is something that that clearly. Um, discloses your invention, then you know um, there's there's no point in patenting it because there's there's no commercial market for it. You know, so um, if there are concerns like that, I would encourage them to contact their licensing officer and see how they can resolve it's it. Typical in company, they have a sort of oversight committee and technical review board to review all the ROI and make a decision to go forward or not. Mm -hmm. And in Mercy, because we cover such a wide spectrum of research area. So it's very hard for one organization, OTA, to make a decision based on some pattern search. Right? So a lot of things probably, probably are exploring 10 years down the road, and they need to come to the office to explain. But at the same time, uh, some of the market's not ready yet. So if you do assessment on the market side, probably we're too advanced. Right? So, so there need to be a, a way to bring two sides together and so that we can understand each other. I personally have no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, through uh, OTA's office, uh, all of you help me. I have 15 patents from UCI. I said, I have no problem. But I have received many comments from faculty. That's why I try to look for um, methods to, to bring two sides together. It's my impression that typically the cases that GP is talking about where it's not really <laughs> always, nobody comes back and says, well, this is. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem with it. It's usually they can't. It's hard to find a licensing partner, right? It's the licensing yeah. partner that becomes the, the stumbling block. The stumbling yeah. block for this, and uh, I think one of the problems, inherent problems with university innovation, along these lines, is that in most cases, I think maybe maybe the vast majority of cases, uh, the technology is somewhat disruptive to existing companies, and when they see that. It's not something they really want to take on because their current customer base isn't asking for it. Mm -hmm. They don't have the, they don't have the time and resources to put towards that. <laughs> and 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 what really is needed is a, a smaller startup company to come in yes. and take that and work with the, the the small market that they can work with because their overhead's not as much. And, so. and and we don't really I guess Tech Portal is really the first. We certainly joint venture yeah. with uh, Arcan and the OTA yeah. and Campus. That is one to bring community together. Yeah. So, you know, it's almost as if we should have had Tech Portal first, <laughs> you know, and, and, and done most of our I IT that. <laughs> with that sort of an organization as opposed to find, trying to find an established licensing partner out in the industry. I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining because I think the obvious. The obvious thing to do w was to f try to find a licensing partner. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not second guessing what's happened in the past yeah. or blaming anybody for doing it differently. But I think, in hindsight, and the way I, the way I've seen IP flow out of here, is that um, a, a lot of it could have been commercialized with you know, a small startup I mean, and, and as opposed to getting left on. The caveat to that is that we do want to find licenses that can adequately and diligently proceed with the IP. Right, right. So yeah. you can have 100 startup companies and have tons of licenses, but they're not doing anything because they don't have the resources, the training, the money, the access to the people they need. So essentially, you're having your IP just sitting in licenses that are, for all intents and purposes, dormant, right? Well, that's, so you know, that's a, that's a risk with any startup company, but the, the thing about this, the startup is that it, it it can take that technology and survive on a fair, relatively small market, whereas an established company can't do that. They've got to have big numbers. They've got to have a big market from the very beginning. And a lot of the technologies that come out here are, you know, they're so far out there because, you know, faculty are out there, right? So they're far out there. There's not going to be that many people that are going to be interested in, in, in purchasing that yes. yet. Yeah. No, right. But eventually, you know, these things eventually take over the established markets that were there before, and and so you know, I, and I think we've seen that over and there's books written on this. Yeah, and, and the middle ground there very well maybe they have in these license 
arrangements with the small startups benchmarks, and if they don't satisfy the benchmarks, <laughs> you can terminate the license. And, well, there's and, definitely, though, the yeah. license, absolutely. Yes. But we also need our startups to, to pay the patent prosecution costs, and they oftentimes don't have the revenue to develop the product and pay the patent costs. So almost out the door, they're essentially you know, setting themselves up for default of the license terms already. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question of you know, they're, they're kind of keeping that IP active. We also need them to start paying the costs on that. Otherwise, the university is essentially carrying those costs for a private benefit. You know? Well, I, I would say if you had a choice, you know. If I had a choice. If you had a license, <laughs> if you had a choice between a license and a startup, oh, of course, go with an established company. Because they do have the infrastructure and the capital and everything. But if you don't have a licensee, why not try the startup? We don't have a bias and, against and, startups and try, at all. At least try to move it with that right. sort of. Right, you know. and we do not have a bias against startups at all. No, I, I agree with that. No, I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we didn't have something like a tech portal before mm -hmm. where a lot of this IP that's restricted could just move out on a small market and see what happens. Mm -hmm. We're working on that. Uh, what so thank you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'd like to add, um, we've licensed, I'm with the startup company, it's a medical device, technology at UCLA and UC now. And raising money in this environment for a free revenue company is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I think a commercialization attempt, you know, through, through Octane and different types of companies, organizations, is, is necessary because I think the business community can get the startup funded easier. Mm -hmm. And can um, you know professors that love their technology but don't understand the, uh, the ramifications in the, in the commercial markets? Yeah. There's definitely a way to do it, and I'd be very interested in, in helping the organization as with a lot of people. Do you have a question back? Well, I, I just wanted to say that I think that the um, okay. Now the California taxpayer. <laughs> <laughs> Which may have been um, you, you have to realize that when we prosecute. I mean, Speaking now as an OTA employee, when we pro when we put a case and vision into prosecution without a lot of potential licensee, guess who's paying for it? The taxpayer. And so we, you know, we really have to. We are very conscious of that. And so, yes. Tech Portal, uh, all of the uh, incubation companies are very important to us so that we aren't putting the taxpayer at risk for something that's not going to be commercialized. So we're, you know, I mean, it, it, we are constantly, you know, we're, we're the, I don't know what that Greek goddess was, but <laughs> with, with the scale, we're, we're constantly trying to balance that. So a tech portal, Octane, all of those things are really, really important to the university in trying to get these wonderful discoveries and inventions out there. And don't be too hard on us if we have to turn down some that may, you know, five or ten years from now be really the, the next great thing. But we're, as taxpayers, we're spending your dollars for, what is it? I'm sure you will validate patent prosecution. It's not cheap. And so, you know, we're, we're constantly balancing this. So the more you can do to help us develop companies that will pay those costs and not lay it on to the taxpayers, we really appreciate it. So I don't have well, a limited budget. No, yeah. no. We don't. And I, I don't want to seem ungrateful. I, mean, oh, I, no, no, I, I, I can tell you, I'm, a, I'm amazed at what you all can do. <laughs> With what little budget you have, and I know how, how little that is, and, <laughs> and I, I'm, you know I want to compliment. I don't, I'm not complaining about the way OT is worked or is working. I'm just saying that if, as far as the infrastructure that we uh, really need to have, um, we're not quite there yet. But hopefully, we're getting there. See, and I think one of the most exciting things about OTA is not uh, as much the the patent process through OTA but the process to license technology inherent within right, the right. university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if a licensee comes to us or a faculty member comes to us and says, we already have a licensee lined up, right, that's ideal because we've already got someone who's, right? And I mean, if that's there, but when it does happen, <laughs> it, it's great. Sometimes but it happens. It, it sometimes, <laughs> yeah. when you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that, it's fine, you know, it's, it's being able to 
uh, devote resources to something that may not have a life of fee with the kind of reassurance that you're making a good investment of or, or how about you know, you know coming to you with an idea like I have this idea I want to start a company around it let's get the intellectual property and then I'll license the intellectual property from the university I think that would also be a, an a good line. scenario yeah. Yeah. <laughs> from that standpoint, the equation from, from, from uh, being a business or an entrepreneur um, what can you expect to pay the license is there a range um, I would say it ranges depending on the technology, the stage of the technology. The size of the market and all that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, you look at comparables and what else is kind of on the market in that particular, you know, space and, and use those as kind of a, a ballpark to start negotiations. Oh, it's all negoti negotiations? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Back and forth. Go ahead. How much revenue does all of the royalties and patent licenses create for the I was thinking the total number is 50 to uh, <coughs> kind of 50 to 60 range a year. Could be. UCI alone, at our heyday, we made probably around seven. This was before the housing bus, right? This was probably <laughs> 2006, 2007. I think we were at seven million a year. But that you, you know where our, that information yeah, is all in the, uh, the uh, magazine, actually. Well, yeah, it was in the. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Off the Department of Research annual report mm -hmm. yeah, that's an for, that, that for the out. UC system. Right. That comes from the Office of President. That well, yeah, no, there's an annual report. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, um, one of the big winners for UC is the strawberry. <laughs> so you never know where the big winner is going to come. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, we, we, we do prosecute cases at, at risk means we don't have anyone who's going to reimburse the prosecution expenses, which are not minor, and especially in international prosecution. I mean, if we're doing foreign prosecution, that's very expensive. And that's considered a risk, and it risk means on the taxpayer. So if one measure of success for OTA is whether or not we're turning profit every year, then we're very successful because we have been turning we both learned every year. So let me just say that the, the biggest or the best source for finding licensees might be in, in the inventor or myself. Because they're the ones who are the experts around the field. They're the ones who may have contacts with or collaborations with um, industry partners. They're the ones who go to the trade shows and conferences. Might have graduate students who are now working for uh, companies that may be potential licensees. Number one and number two, they themselves can take the initiative and say, hey, I want to start a company based upon the technology that I developed. And we always encourage them. And we'll always work with UC. That's something that we've done in the past many, many times. There's conflict of interest that, has, that we have to go through. But, um, it could be done. And we can help you do that. Yeah, we have between thir 32 and 34, I have to check their status, um, continuing startup companies that come, have come out of UC. So it's it's not you know it's not you know it's, that's very important. To yeah. In the last five licenses that I've done, four of them with startups, yeah. the inventors themselves, and startup companies make a lot of technology. Yeah. So go out and invent, mm -hmm. patent, license, start companies, great job. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, maybe it's a good time to thank uh, thank Stephen and Mega and appreciate your time and uh, a lot of participation.